Welcome back and thanks for staying with us. You're watching The Agenda. A significant number of South African children face the risk of abuse, neglect and violence on each passing day. Places that are supposed to be safe havens for uh, uh, children such as homes, schools and public spaces have proven to be the very ones uh, that are the biggest source of danger. We're constantly hearing news about violence in schools, shining the spotlight on child and child criminal offences. These it's incidents occur uh, at the beginning of uh, a very important month in the South African calendar, Youth Month, as we draw closer to the end of Child Protection Week, we thought to bring into focus the issue of criminal offences that are committed by children on other children. By law, the child victims of crime are protected. However, child offenders also require protection, but then to what degree? To discuss this uh, and other child protection matters, we joined in the studio by renowned uh, psychologist Professor Seth Cooper, who also happens to be uh, a member of the board of the SABC. Thank you so much for making the time to join us this morning, uh, Prof. Um, uh, but we're also joined uh, by, from our, not our Pretoria studio, we have a guest that we're expecting from the Pretoria studios, uh, uh, Lali Temba Strai, but uh, they're not able to join us at this moment. But from our Cape Town studios, we're joined by Patrick Solomons, who's the director at Molo Show. Lolo. A very good morning to you, Mr. Solomons. He is uh, with Children's uh, Rights, uh, a, a Children's Rights Advocacy Group. A very good morning, Mr. Solomons. Hi, good morning to you too. Prof, a very important month in the life of young people in South Africa, Youth Month. Um, but it also has a sort of a, a personal uh, story in terms of your development, your coming into politics. Just take us back there for the benefit of our young viewers who are watching and wondering who is Seth Cooper in the story of the uh, development of a democratic South Africa? Well, uh, June 16, 1976 happened plumb in the middle of our defense uh, in the Sasso BPC trial. Uh, Steve Biko was testifying and uh, all the things that were alleged by the state against the South African Students Organization and the Black People's Convention uh, came to be borne out by the events of uh, June 16. But uh, if truth be told, we were advised months before that something was happening in Soweto and the leadership there was concerned that we were on trial and if Soweto erupted we would definitely be convicted but we felt well we're in jail now yeah. we're not in leadership outside and you need to do what you need to do that was a turning point just as Sharpville in March 1960 was a turning point this was the second major turning point in our country's history and very significantly the leadership began to change the leadership from the Mandela's and the Sobukwe's and the Sisulu's changed to people in their late teens and early 20s because that's that's what our ages were but in Soweto it moved to early teens and mid-teens the Murphy Morobes, the Seth Mazibukos, the uh, Spongile um, Cabelas were all in their mid teens, and they, Tsietsa Machinini, led this major demonstration against the imposition of Afrikaans. And the rest is history because Absolutely. the majority of young people impacted uh, left the country. They filled the ranks of the ANC and to a lesser extent the PAC and Mkonto Asizwe was revitalized. Um, in 1977, the death of uh, Steve Biko in police custody happened and, the follow, uh, uh, and soon thereafter there were uh, bannings of all these organizations, 19 organizations, uh, four newspapers. So this allowed for the ANC to return into the country and take center stage. So it's significant that we're talking about youth, but all over youth are disenfranchised, the world over. In our country in particular, they constitute the majority of our uh, population, but we don't seem to be hearing 
and taking care of their needs. We seem to be more engrossed in our issues mm -hmm. than cater for the future, our youth. I'm sure law and order people are going to now say, look, uh, if kids commit crime, they must do the time. We actually forget that kids imitate what we do. Kids are born innocent but are socialized by us into the ways that they adopt. So when kids do these things, something is gravely wrong in our society. Which makes it quite important that you hear with us today the trajectory of your progress from an activist, politician and now a psychologist. In your experience, what sort of conversations should be taking place with young people, as you're saying? They're the majority of the population. Just recently we had an election and it was reported that the available numbers and percentages of youth that are available to vote uh, rejected uh, going to the polls. Yes, you see, youth are, are faced with what we portray out there. The media, for instance, social media is a major influence. There's a sense of hopelessness uh, and has been in our society that's been rising over the last few years. Thankfully, in the last year and, and a half or so, there's been a sense of hope uh, heightened by the election. But the youth are still wary. They, they feel that things are not happening where they are involved and participating in it. And so we need to change how we're doing things. We can't continue as if it's business as usual. We need to en en engage them in decisions that impact on them. Not do for them, but e ensure that they participate in that decision making because then they will own processes. If we do continue to do things on behalf of people, instead of involving them in that decision making, they will not be part of the solution. And that's what's happening classically with our children. Our schools are overcrowded, our education system is being, has been dumbed down, and they're not able to effectively participate in the world of work when they leave school or they drop out. They're not able to effectively compete with middle class kids mm -hmm. and and i'm talking now about the vast that majority is so that is of problematic children, yeah they whose parents save scrimp going to second mortgages to send them to so-called model c schools and all these uh, fly-by-night private institutions that emerge out there there's no supervision of kids in fact i think the caring compassion that president ramaphosa talked about on uh, freedom day in, in Makanda this year, that compassion, we've tended to lose. We haven't got compassion and feeling for each other. We always think about me, myself, I, 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 now, 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 instead of looking at what is it we can do together to change our circumstances. Let's bring in Patrick Solomons. Molosong Ololo is doing such amazing work in terms of uh, the protection of children's rights. What is your experience in terms of uh, children amongst themselves recognizing each other's rights? Well, what we do find is that um, despite the increased awareness around human rights and uh, and also children's rights, we still have large numbers of children that are not properly informed about um, their rights, understanding what their rights are, understanding what the meaning of their rights. So we're still lacking in, 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 in with that regard. We still have an education system that don't effectively um, educate and inform and engage children with human rights issues, child rights issues. So you um, might find children growing up, going through the school system, have no idea how to interpret their rights. The right to, uh, for example, education, what does that mean? The right to health, for example, what does that mean? The right to clean drinking water, for example, what does that mean? We see our municipalities and our government buying lots and lots of bottled water. Have they abandoned the right to clean drinking tap water? And how do children relate to that? So we still have a long way to go. But we've made good progress, but we still have a very, very long way to go. That conversation about water, of course, being a Cape Town-centric conversation that we hope everybody else in the nation will understand it. You work very closely with children as victims and offenders. What have you discovered um, are child and child sexual offenders getting younger? Yeah, um, 
You know, children, um, like the previous speaker said, children often mimic what they see. And children's behavior reflects um, the, be uh, like, you know, the environment in which they live and, and um, the people that they engage with. So children sort of um, act out a lot of stuff that they see, that they experience. Um, and we find that the number of children that um, commit uh, sexual uh, violence um, on other children um, is increasing. So, and also the ages are seem to be getting younger and younger. And what we have found is that one of the reasons for that is because children are exposed to sexual content more and more, to sexual attitudes more and more, sexual behavior more and more. And I think that's one of the main contributing factors because children by nature act out. Children by nature watch and see what adults and others are doing around them. And then of course also there's the issue of peer pressure. Um, you have to conform, you have to be with a group, there's a bullying that happens, the grooming that happens. So there's all of these factors that influence how children would behave. And like the previous speaker also said, because of the lack of supervision, children also then would act out a whole range of things that they ordinarily would not do when they're in the presence of their parents and caregivers and being supervised. Children um, have the capacity to get up to mischief. I'm mean, like we all have, um, as children, we all get up to one kind or other kind of mischief. But I think what we see now is that more and more children seemingly make a decision to behave badly, to do wrong, to do something that they know they should not be doing, sometimes even know that it is a crime. And I think that is what we see, there's an increase in that kind of behavior of children. Prof, what's the ideal society that we would love to see our children developing into teenagers and eventually uh, uh, adults who are part of society? Well, we need social stability, which we don't have. We need economic certainty, which we also don't have. And we need a society that is safe for children, which safety we don't have. And we need to be able to nurture our children as part of us, rather than just leave them to fend for themselves, yes. which is increasingly becoming the norm. Which section of the society are we talking to? I imagine people watching us now who are uh, perhaps parents and are thinking, where am I going wrong? I hear the prof saying all of these parts are missing. But at an individual level, what can parents do? What can schools do? Um, what can churches do? Well, we're in an age where information is instant and social media is upon us. Our kids are becoming socialized through uh, artificial means rather than through the necessary engagement that they ought to have. With your within, immediate community. You, absolutely. Within the family, nuclear family, extended family, w we don't have communities anymore. In fact, uh, when we wow. grew up, we, d we grew up differently. We don't really have communities uh, to speak of. We use the term community, but how much of a community do we really have? We've all become dismembered. We've all become atomized as individuals. And in that uh, individuality creeps in the lack of sense of agency that we ought to impart to our children. Our children ought to feel part of what's happening. They should not be dismembered from the rest of what's going on. And right now we have this huge gap yeah. that is happening with our kids. And sure enough, in a couple of years time, we'll be speaking about the same issues if we don't change how we socialize and educate our children. We need to put more effort into consciously thinking about changing that system. Not throw money into the problem because we're one of the countries that has the highest budgets for education, but the outcomes are so appalling. We can and must And that's change. an important intervention Absolutely. in the process. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So I'm part of, for instance, that group that came from the late 60s, early 70s, across political barriers, people with unity movement, uh, black consciousness, pan-African, uh, ANC background, and we've decided we're going to be active in shaping 
this society. The president has said to Mamina, we are answering that call. We are answering that call not merely because the president is part of that generation, but also because we feel it's, it's the right thing to do. Yeah. We must do this. If we don't, we believe that we are shirking our responsibility and we are allowing our children to grow up without our essential involvement. Mr. Solomon, should we be going back to historical communities or should we be adapting to the new way of being? Well, like we cannot um, deny the fact that you know, we are in a developmental state and we are moving on and society is not static. Um, the speaker sort of alluded to the fact that support systems have broken down for families, for communities. So we find that a lot of um, parents, they have to fend for themselves and they struggle by all by themselves. They don't often have the support of their neighbours or their family, extended family members and stuff like that. So support systems have broken down. We've also seen that the, a lot of especially poor families and, and poor children struggle to access services and support services being provided by civil society or even by the government. So there's a lot of challenges that people are experiencing. We also have things like substance abuse, for example, dysfunction within the home, violence in itself, domestic violence in the home, for example, on the streets, in the school. A lot of um, children, especially our poor children, experience these things every, every day. So as we have a sort of a, a try to promote a rights culture in South Africa, uh, like you know, a lot of children also don't experience their uh, and, uh, and enjoy their rights on a daily basis. They experience multiple rights violations. So we uh, um, we have situation where almost about sixty percent of, of South African children are very very poor, find themselves uh, challenged every day. Um, whether it is in the home or on, on the way to school or at school or in the community. So they experience a multiple um, sort of challenges where their rights are being infringed, where they find themselves in situations of vulnerability and even at high risk. And coupled with the, uh, uh, with the context of violence, our children um, seem to um, respond easier to lash out to be violent, to do things that um, would be inappropriate, for example. And um, so we don't have uh, children in those kinds of situations don't um, get the opportunity to learn about how to solve problems, how to do things differently, how to do things in a non-violent kind of way. And I think that is something that we need to really, really look at. Parents are always the last to find out when the child misbehaved, did something bad, uh, behaved wrongly, committed a crime. And I think we also need to look at parenting, for example. Um, and I think a lot of parents expect the best of the kids and have, uh, like, you know, we, you know, and we hope that parents will be able to make sure that they can get the best out of their children. Unfortunately, that is not the situation for many, many children. Many fathers have abandoned their children. Mothers are struggling all by themselves to rear their children. So we really have a, a, a children, especially poor children from the poorest sectors of society, especially children where there's uh, from dysfunctional families and communities where there's a lack of services, they have it tough. And it's in those communities where we've seen a tremendous increase on child and child violence, for example. And I think that's what we need to look at. We need to look at um, increased uh, uh, parent support services, for example. We need to reduce um, unwanted pregnancies and early pregnancy, for example. That is something that we need to look at very effectively. Um, child health, public health, for example, needs to look at adolescent sexual health issues needs to be looked at. And then, of course, things like jobs and job creation and people earning decent wages, livable wages, for example, needs to need to look at. Yeah. And then, of course, we need to look at our services that children deserve and should have because it is their right to have these services. Are they getting these services? Are the children that are in need getting these services? What we also find quite challenging is that despite the beautiful laws that we have in South Africa, whether it's the Child Justice Act that deals with children who's in conflict with the law, or the Children's Act, for example, trying to implement, make sure that children can enjoy their rights, or, the, um, or all the other laws that we have, the problem that we have is still implementation. Yeah. And a big challenge that we have is that the people who are supposed to provide the basic services um, don't have a 
good grasp of, of, of the law, what their uh, re responsibilities are, and often they fail in their duty to respect the rights of the child when they have to process and, and, and manage that child. But of course children cannot enjoy their rights independent of their adult parents or other members of society. What uh, emphasis do we put on the mental health of the people who are supposed to make sure that you enforce the rights of children? We have, um, the, the big challenge that we have is that um, a lot of parents are very, very young, right? Children who have committed very serious crime um, that we've seen is that they've come from other situations where there's issues of control, right, that uh, they have in family. These are normally children from your more middle class uh, families. Issues of control, issues of um, expectations, um, and then of course also having to deal with uh, in terms of boundaries, right? understanding what their boundaries are. And then children, what we find from, you know, from the poorest sectors who commit serious crime, we often find that they were born into a situation of violence. They were born into a situation of dysfunction. They were socialized very early onwards to become violent through violent attitudes, behavior, language, talk, dress, all of those kind of yeah. stuff. The whole uh, presentation is a presentation of violence. Gangsterism, for example, um, it also becomes glorified. So these are children that were born into this, this kind of situation, this toxic situation. And they often commit crime uh, uh, that uh, appears to be forced because of poverty-related conditions, conditioning because of the, uh, the, uh, the violent uh, nature of that uh, community. And then, of course, also opportunistic crime. And, and those are the kind of difference that we have seen. We've also seen there's a lot of peer pressure. And how do parents then mitigate against all of these things? Parents are unable to protect their children when the children are not in their care, when they're outside, at school, and all that kind of stuff. And children ordinarily misbehave when they're not being supervised, when they're not uh, um, in the uh, family home. Yeah. Why do a child misbehave very badly in a classroom and not at home? And I think those are some of the things that we need to look at um, in terms of something goes wrong. Something goes wrong in terms of children f sometimes feel they have more license to do as they please in certain kinds of situations. And so children easily violate other people's rights in a particular space, and then at the same time claim, want to claim their own rights, right? So they would, they would hit people, they would stab and uh, even shoot at, um, um, learners and teachers in, at, at school. But when it happens to them, they feel that their rights have been violated. There's so so some, how there's something terribly wrong in the way children um, see their rights the way children engage in the uh, environment, and often they themselves would say that they have no other option but to protect themselves. Professor Cooper... Right, so before uh, someone's going to hit me, before someone's going to stab me, I'm going to stab that person first. Almost being defensive. Professor Cooper, uh, Mr. Solomons is talking about the most vulnerable, the poor communities uh, being most affected. But a term came out during this Fees Must Fall uh, campaign where there was a recognition of something called the missing middle. We were talking earlier on the show with somebody who's a gender specialist about the need to move away from female or male or just uh, a gay and recognizing the whole spectrum of, of gender identities. How can we do that for this conversation, recognize children who come from poor families, recognize the challenges of children who come from middle class families, the different spectrum of young people and the different issues that they face? Well, first of all, I think it's important to recognize that they are our children. We got to start there. They're not somebody else's children in and we need to take responsibility for that. Whether they're poor, whether they come from a wealthier background, the, all our children uh, in the main confront the same issues that we've already raised right now. Okay. And the influences 
that are brought to bear. Uh, you know, I cannot help but thinking about W.B. Yeats when uh, in his poem he says, the, the best lack all, uh, co uh, lack all commitment and the worst are full with passionate intensity. The examples we have the examples we have are the worst. We actually are presenting the worst examples to our kids. And our kids follow that. In, when I go into the traffic Why now, is that though? Well, it's because we lack good leadership. We have mediocre, we have pusillanimous leadership. The mediocrity... Leadership at home, leadership at school. Across the board. Leadership at government. At political, at social, at religious levels at school levels we just don't have sterling leadership that one would have thought that structures such as NGOs and churches w were put in place to try and mitigate this yes but you see the malcreants amongst us who find gaps and in these years when we've been sliding uh, southwards they have found loopholes for themselves and that's why there's been a clamor about the religious sector, for instance, the abuse that takes place there, the, uh, the imposition uh, that self-proclaimed prophets are involved in with young people, uh, whether boys or girls, all those kinds of things. We're a society, Desiree, that is so violent that we outstrip countries that are actually at war. The statistics tell a story that we tend to, to ignore. ignore. We ignore and it. We're at war. The amount of uh, gender-based violence, the femicide, and so on, they sky high. We have the most violence of any society in the world that's not at war. And perhaps we're at war with ourselves. Yeah. We haven't come into being. And we've got all these divides. The class divides, the ethnic and racial divides, and so on. And we, we now need to act actually say, we are one country. We need to treat of our children as if they, be, not as if, as our own. We need to own our children. We need to actually take comfort in the fact that all those young people out there, there but for the grace of, go my own kids. And we need to treat of them in that way. When we start changing our own personal views on things and look at our essential humanism and humanity and accord other people, especially young people, children, mm -hmm. the same humanity, we would have made a massive difference. They are human beings. We ought to embrace them. We ought to uh, realign those forces that uh, are making them do what they do. Patrick Solomon, what are some of the interventions that uh, Molo Shongololo has in place, especially in this particular area of uh, children against children violence, um, that you're perhaps working with other NGOs or with government or with different partners, even if it's international partners, to try and, and bring about some sort of uh, a semblance of uh, sorting out uh, uh, the human rights issue amongst children? Well, one of the first things that we try and do is to, um, like, you know, to embrace and also get others to embrace a kind of non-violent approach to the work that we do. So it's also about uh, promoting a non-violent attitudes, for example, non-violent behavior. And then, of course, also to make sure that people understand, uh, you know, what is, what is violence. Um, a lot of people, a lot of children grow up with a kind of attitudes and behavior, and they don't know that they, they're violent. And I think that is uh, some of our challenges that we, we have. So for, for example, a child who in this normal vocabulary use a swear word every, in every second sentence, for example, might see that as normal, normal way of communicating. And, and so it's about those kind of things we need to do. At another level, of course, is to ensure that children know and understand their rights. So we must take time to make sure that they know and understand their rights and need to know what is right and what's wrong. And therefore, things like values are very important. What are the principles and values that we're promoting with children, in families, with parents, and all that kind of stuff. And then, of course, also the big challenge that children have is the double standards of adults and parents. 
you know, they say one thing and then they do the other thing. They never fulfill the promise. And that is quite rife that we experience in many of the children that we, we work with. And then, of course, also the other thing is that parents are never, never prepared for when the children do misbehave, when the children have committed a crime. So parents seem to be in, um, ill-informed about children and crimes around children and what to do when the child misbehaves, where to go and seek help and all that kind of stuff. And also then the other thing what we all do and parents always do, because we, we always try and want other people to fix what went wrong. So we run to the police station, we want the police to sort out and fix everything. We run to the lawyer, we want the lawyer to fix and sort it out. We want we go to the to the to, to the to the hospital and they fix they must everybody else must fix it. Parents very seldom look at themselves and say, What is it that I need to fix for me and for my child? What changes that must I bring for me and uh, for my child? And I think that's something that we really, really need to look at. We find that the more and more we work with parents to engage with them around these issues when their child is committed uh, an offence, misbehaved, uh, behaved badly, for example, we need to work with the parents because we often find that parents sometimes experience a lot of trauma in their childhood. Parents themselves um, maybe even committed an offence in their childhood and never really dealt with it, they just moved on. And therefore, when we trace back the violent behavior sometimes of parents, we trace it back to their childhood. So working with parents on a one-on-one -on -one basis and groups of parents, trying to develop support systems for parents and yeah. for their children. And of course, getting children to understand um, you know, that they committed a crime, what the impact of the crime is on them and on their family and on the victims themselves. Patrick that Solomon. That is also very, very important. That's where we're going to have to end it. Thank you so much for making the time um, this morning to come and talk to us about this very important conversation. Thank you so much to you. Prof, in closing, what for you are the ways that young people in this day and age can take their lives forward as we close off this child protection week. I think the first thing is our children as soon as they are of uh, a conscious age ought to begin to recognize that they have a certain power in our society. We are a human rights based constitutional democracy. Mm -hmm. They have the ability to uh, raise issues and they ought to organize themselves into groups of young people. They can't be onlookers. No, they cannot. Yeah. And instead of uh, aping those who are taking to the streets and protesting and destroying and doing those kinds of things, our children actually need to say there must be a different way. Make us listen, make society listen to our children because that's a very powerful voice. Return to the 70s where young people really were our conscience yeah. and made the changes happen in this country. Our kids can do it, they must do it, they will save all of us. Again, thanks to both of you for making the time this Saturday morning. Patrick Solomon is a director at Molo Shongololo and we were also talking to psychologist Professor Seth Cooper. Let's take a break. You're watching the agenda. Join us again at the top of the hour for the last hour of the show.